Let me tell you a story. I was born in London, shipped to India at the age of three with my parents. Did early school there, moved to North Carolina for my college, then ended up in Boise, Idaho, working for Micron Technology. So I had lived and traveled across half the globe before I got my first real job. My family uh, belongs to a religion called Sikh, that's spelled S-I-K-H, which actually matches the literal translation of the word, which is to seek knowledge, to learn. Now, one of the tenets of this faith is to not cut your hair. So, to keep my hair tidy, I tie a turban around my head. Now, the color of the turban usually doesn't mean much, except it's a fashion statement, just to match the color of your wardrobe. Now, if you see a bunch of people with colorful turbans, now you know. However, if you see people dressed up like this, with big, flaring turbans, that usually means they're getting ready to jiggy. <laughs> yep, jiggy. So, I don't know about you, but every time I see people dressed up like this, certain music starts playing in my head. Something takes over my body. And just like that young, handsome man, in that picture, I start doing this. Do you hear anything yet? That was fun. <laughs> Sorry, let's get back to the topic, which was, oh, innovation. So first, let me ask you this. Give me an honest answer. You can give me a show of hands if you want. Have you ever danced to a music or a song for no reason whatsoever? Whoa. Moved by lyrics to a great song or a poem. Got emotional while watching a play or a movie or a great inspiring speech. <laughs> Maybe that was a little too much. How about, have you ever felt an urge to repair or fix things? Like a lock to your house, a door to your house, your car, your bike? certain relative in your family, <laughs> your teenage child, your parent when you were a teenager? Or how about this? You've been sitting here for the last couple of hours. Did you have an urge once to fix the person sitting right next to you? <laughs> Great, no show of hands please for that. <laughs> so if the answer to any of those questions was yes, Congratulations, you have an inside of you ingredients of a great world-class innovator. Uh, so what is innovation? There's an old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. So in general, when we are faced with a certain sticky situation, we all have this capability to find a creative solution out of it. It could be anything. We do it in different ways and depends on the circumstances we are in, and the solution matches the problem we are faced with. It has no bearing on what your education is, what your background is, who you are. We all do it. Let me show you examples of innovation on the streets of India. <laughs> now, you can argue who got the better end of the deal, <laughs> those two people standing outside, or that person hanging upside down. However, collectively, they had a situation. They figured out a problem, solution to the problem. So we call it the human digging machine, street side cappuccino machine. No electricity required. Yes, that is a screwdriver. Now, if the only machine you own is a bike and you have to make do with it, and you have certain tasks, 
like hauling a bunch of bricks from point A to point B. Well, you find a way to pack them on a brick, uh, on a bike. Now, if you live in a flood-prone area and you have to cross a body of water, well, you have two choices, carry the bike on your head or find a way to float that bike underneath you. Now, if you own a shiny <laughs> bike, which is your most prized possession, well, you turn into a family transporter every time you need to move your family. You find a way to pack your dog. <laughs> By the way, there is a puppy out there too, up <laughs> way out there. We all have this ability to find the solution to the problem we are in. We do it for different reasons. To improve pro productivity, we have made machines which can do work faster. We have developed electricity, create wealth, do good, help children, cure diseases. Or we do it just for the expression of creativity. Fine arts, painting, music, inner satisfaction, feel good. All are reasons why we innovate. Now, going back into our history, starting from the Stone Age tools, we have been innovating for thousands of years. Now, right about the time, about 7,000 BC, it seems like we figured out how to make alcohol. <laughs> and our innovation rate seems to have gone up a little bit. <laughs> it was probably because of tea and coffee, but we can argue that. That pace has continued to this day and only increased tremendously in modern times. Now, these innovations have impact on society, and usually it's positive impact. Just think about our ancestors mastered fire. They knew how to control fire, which obviously led to equal playing field against predators at night, but also helped us sit around the fire, exchange stories, develop language skills, storytelling, developed sharing of information and creativity and solving problems. In fact, this could be the first example in the, of the ancient internet where we were able to exchange information. Now, some of these inno innovations along the way serve as a catalyst for a faster rate of innovation. And we can see the printing press, phone. Right after those innovations, it seems like the pace of innovations has increased. And this is a modern example of internet, 1995. Look at the number of patents. It has skyrocketed after the internet was invented and used by most of the people. Now, the adoption rate of these innovations has also been getting faster over time. Some of the older innovations took 30 to 40 years to uh, adopt by the common uh, population. But lately, that internet was adopted in less than 10 years. Think of a smartphone which was invented only 10 years ago in the form which you have. Every teenage child in this world, regardless of the country where they live, have one. That's an amazing speed for innovation. On the left is the first computer I saw when I was in college. It was a big box of things in a big room. I thought this was cool. It was a really cool thing. Since then, there's been a million times improvement in performance and capability. And what you have in your pocket is 200 times more powerful than computer I saw. But that's not the only story. What you pay $20 for, your memory, would have cost $14 million when I was a student. So it's not the innovation only or performance. It's to make it more affordable so everybody can use it. That is the key of these innovations. So, so in terms of question now we have is, where are we headed? My career usually feels like being on a zip line. Uh, this is how the high-tech industry is. You are going down the rope. The speed is increasing. You don't have much control. But what you're trying to do is head in the right direction. Head, keep your head down, face front, and try to make sure we, we can control the direction we are going. Most important, however, you got to look cool while doing it. The exponential growth of computing. Uh, a computer in 2000 had the capability equivalent of a one insect brain. Pretty soon, we will have a computer which can match the capability of a human brain. A few decades from now, we'll have a computer which will match the capability of all human brains. That's all human brains on this planet. That's the pace of innovation. 
in the, in the field of technology of memory and storage, it's a similar story. If we look at uh, some of the uh, markets, for example, astronomy, which is scientific computing, YouTube, which is consumer electronics, genomics is a new field. If you look at the demand for memory and storage from 2015 to 2025, the projections are there'll be exponential growth in the need for storage. But if you think about genomics, which is a new field of the DNA technology and the healthcare sector and the medicine, it breaks the scale. You've got to change the scale. It's, there's a huge requirement for memory and storage. Why is that? Well, you all know the, the new field of genomics is going to make possible new ways to cure disease. That's where we say medicine meets big data. Because your genome or the DNA can be mapped now, which is pretty affordable. A few hundred dollars, you can get the DNA mapped. Once, and there's a lot of information in our DNA, 30,000 genes, 3 billion gene pairs. It's five terabytes to store. What does the 5T mean? That's 5,000 billion bits of information about you. Once we store that information, find the correlations, there'll be new cures, new ways to solve medical problems, which will come in. Now, that's only half the story. All of us have microbiome, these microbes which live inside of us. We have four pounds of microbes inside of us. Think about the microbe in your gut, which, lets you, which helps you uh, digest food. There's many other microbes inside our body. Very important to our health. There's been recent studies that if you monitor those microbes, you can detect changes in the DNA of these microbes one year before people get sick. Imagine the power of predictive capability for your health. So all this will happen for two reasons. Healthcare, our health is important to us, but the cost of health is also very important to us. If we make better decisions about the healthcare using these technologies, you can, be, you can do preventive healthcare and the cost of healthcare is likely to drop. You've heard of artificial intelligence. AI is going to be a game changer. Uh, with the improvements in computer and memory technology, it's going to touch us in every aspect of our life. Self-driving cars, mobile devices which can recognize you, listen to you, understand you, you name it. The data storage needs, because of all this, even the load estimate says you're going to need one billion kilograms of silicon to store this information in the next few hours, a few decades, not few hours. <laughs> so a few years ago, I was talking to my colleagues, and we were thinking about what else can we do? Can we find different ways to store information? And one of them suggested DNA as a molecule where you can store information. Now, the physicist in me said, well, was very skeptical. Now, how could that be? So we actually did a study and published this paper. And surprisingly, DNA is a very robust material to store information. And it's a very compact way to store information. And information can last for up to 100 years based on this study. So if we're able to do this, it could solve a lot of problems for us. Now, before we feel too smart, I just recently learned, in the last few months, in ancient Indian Vedas, which is a book of knowledge, there's a word manas, which actually means memory inside of your body. And they're not talking about the memory we remember, the, our brain. They're talking about nine types of memories. None of them are the ones we remember, we, we think of as memory. For example, they say the, feature, the facial features, skin tone, all that information is passed from generation to generation. Sounds like evolution. They didn't say that. They said body remembers exposure to sickness. So next time you get sick, it can protect you from that sickness. Well, that seems like immune system. So I don't know if they knew about those type of concepts, but they did know that the body can store information in ways which we can't even comprehend over generations. And all that is based on DNA. So if we are able to pull this off, there's a lot of technology to be developed on how to read information, how to write information into DNA, how to store it, and so forth. If you're able to do this, one billion kilograms of silicon will be replaced by one kilogram of DNA. It's that powerful. You can store that much information in DNA. It's a billion to one ratio. 
Now, all of the silicon will not go away, only archi archival type of information probably be stored in DNA. But it's an amazing possibility if you can solve all the technology problems. It's going to take a few years to get there. What does this all mean for us? So in general, hopefully you're convinced, uh, if you look at our history, we know that the technological progress is inevitable. If anything, it has accelerated tremendously over, over time. We used to get, see one new thing over one generation. Our generation has experienced, for the first time, multiple changes in technology, multiple devices, and so forth, within one lifetime. We are the first ones to see that. And it's going to only accelerate. There's naturally a fear of new technology, but we have been able to drive smart behaviors in the past. Imagine if our ancestors did not overcome their fear of fire. We won't be here. So there's a concept of artificial intelligence. People are afraid of it. It's going to be smarter and more powerful than us, possibly. But maybe the way to answer that problem is to put rules and, and, and standards in place so that the ethics of AI are actually slightly better than ours. We haven't done that well with this planet. So it's not the technology which is good or bad. It's how we use it, what we decide how to use technology. We make it good and bad, technology by itself. Nuclear power can make, provide ele electricity. That's a good thing, but we can also do a lot of bad things with it. It's our decision. Technology does not tell us to do it. We could use technology, fossil fuels, has caused a lot of uh, pollution. We could use wind, solar, to solve that energy problem and actually get, uh, get, get rid of the pollution caused by our earlier technologies. But it's, it's up to us to decide. Technology has been here. That technology exists. We have to put policies in place to use it in the right way. Technology can do a lot of good if we will let it. It's our decision. We are all innovators. We can dance, cook, solve problems, decode DNA. But this, it's just all what we do. We don't have to fear technology. It's innate to all of us. We have seen that society has always been part of figuring out how technology is used. We can each play a part in that. Society is us. It's not them. So we all have to take part, get involved, be curious, stay open, stay curious, explore. Thank you.